As you might know, the elders played a crucial role in the creation of Girls Not Brides. And I was very honored uh, to be their CEO at the time that, that they were created. Now, my name is Mabel van Oranje. And like Ras and Michelle said, we are a family. And I'm actually quite emotional to finally be back with my family. We've come a long way. We have a long way to go. But together, we can move mountains. And it is really exciting that from where we started four years ago with the creation of Girls No Brides to see how far we have come. And so what I would like to do this morning is tell you a little bit about what we've done to get here today. And I'm doing that because some of you have walked that way all along with the elders and with all the others who are making change to end child marriage. And others are here for today for the first time and might actually find it interesting to understand what has happened so far. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, the elders decided in 2010 to work on the issue of child marriage because they had a real interest in addressing gender equality and also in tackling the fact that religion and tradition, which are normally forces for good, too often get misused in order to justify discrimination against girls and women. Now, when they saw how big the issue of child marriage is, millions and millions of girls getting married every year before the age of 18, and when they realized how devastating the consequences are for human rights and for development, they decided to do something about it. That's not to say that nothing was happening. There were some very dedicated people and some amazing organizations doing work in individual places. I think of Tostan, I think of the Bahane Herwan project, I think of some of the work happening in Bangladesh. But it was all relatively small and it was not getting the support it needed. Also, let's be honest, four or five years ago, the issue of child marriage was a taboo. The millions of girls getting married every day were pretty much invisible. There was no global conversation about the issue, and those working on the issue were pretty much working in isolation. So the elders decided to change that, together with many of you. And so we came together in June 2011 in Addis Ababa. About 70 people from 55 different organizations, some were already on, working on the issue of child marriage, and others had an interest in doing so. And we were from 23 different countries. And basically what we did is we spent two days, three days, talking about not only what the elders could do to help to give the issue of child marriage more visibility, but also what civil society could do. And so, can I first ask all of you who were actually at this meeting to stand up? Thank you. Without all of you, we would not be here today. Because you know what happened at that meeting? At that meeting, we collectively agreed, first of all, that we would create a partnership. The time to spend time on our own working was over. We were gonna do this together. We also came up with the name, Girls Not Brides. And I still remember exactly what the table was, where the suggestion came from, but I don't know who the individual was. If you know who did that, or actually, if you came up with the name, can you please tell me? Because I want to give you the biggest hug in the world. <laughs> and we came up with our mission statement. We're not going to review this all now, but basically agreed that we were going to do work together to raise more awareness. We were going to work together to create more political and financial support to end child marriage and we're, we're gonna learn from each other about what works and what doesn't work, because we realize that together we are stronger. We also agreed on a few fundamental values which have not changed. One of them is that change ultimately must happen locally. Yes, global awareness is important. 
Yes, UN resolutions are important, national action plans are important, but change ultimately has to happen in the lives of the girls, of their families, and of their communities. We also agreed that ending child marriage um, is an enormous task and that none of us can do it alone. And even that we as civil society can't do it alone. We need to work with governments, with UN agencies, etc. We agreed that we, none of us had all the answers, so we all had to learn together from our successes, but also from our failures. And lastly, we realized that change won't come quickly. So I'm not surprised that we're here together again four years later, and I also think that in four years' time we will be meeting again. But if we keep making the same level of progress, that will be a good thing. Now, we went from Addis Ababa then to formally launch Girls Not Brides. And that was done in New York in September 2011 by the elders. Here you see Archbishop Tutu and Mary Robinson uh, launching Girls Not Brides. We had 48 members at the time from 18 different countries. And we, of course, did not do this alone. Two of our, I'm sorry, can we go back one? Two of our initial found, uh, funders are there as well, the Ford Foundation and the Novo Foundation. And they're not the only funders we've had, but we're very grateful, obviously, because without them we could not have done this. And then we slowly started seeing these first shifts on a global level. So, for example, um, by November 2011, the Commonwealth Heads of State and Government committed to addressing child marriage worldwide. And then we came to the end of the year, and guess what? By the end of the year, we had grown already to 87 members from 20 different countries. And 2012, to a large extent, was, was for the work for Girls No Brides, was focused on mobilizing on a regional level. So in, two th in February 2012, we came together in Delhi with, I see some people recognizing themselves. Why don't you stand up when you, if you were there? You see, we're family. Great. So we had about 70 participants there, and we spent a lot of time talking about what needs to happen in South Asia in order to end child marriage um, and, and getting a better understanding of the situation. We went on to later in the year meet with about 90 people from 24 countries in Johannesburg for our Sub-Saharan African meeting. If you were there, you might as well stand up. Come on! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and this is where we really started plotting common strategies to, to end child marriage. And we had quite a few uh, achievements as well, I think, and we saw a lot of positive developments in 2012. For example, Child marriage became recognized by high-level individuals. The Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations started talking about child marriage. Hillary Clinton, at that time the Secretary of State for the United States, started talking about it. We saw all kind of political momentum grow at the UN, at the High Commission for Human Rights, um, at the G8, at the World Health Assembly. And also the first political commitments from government started coming in. Canada made a major donation and Malawi made the first big stand-up commitment to end child marriage in its country. UNFPA took on child marriage as a flagship issue and we had the first International Day of the Girl Child which was focused on child marriage and which made more than 50 members of Girls No Bite mobilize in 29 countries. And I think we should also do some credit to all of you who work on communications and media, because we saw the number of articles and interviews and programming on television and radio about child marriage really growing. So we were heading in the right direction. And guess what? By the end of the year, we had doubled our membership to more than 200 organizations from 43 countries. Then came 2013. And we started the year with a, members, with a meeting, a workshop on strengthening national collaboration. Because we realized we shouldn't only be collaborating on a global level, but also on a national level. And 70 people leading some of these national collaborative efforts came together. 
And, well, let me ask you, all of you who were there in Istanbul in February, why don't you stand up once more? This is morning gymnastics. <laughs> really good. A lot happened in, in 2013, and I'm not going to mention all these things, but I'll, let me give you just a few, few highlights. Most importantly, we saw a really important shift from just creating more awareness about the impact of child marriage and the importance of why we have to address it into starting a real dialogue about concrete solutions. One thing is to know that we have a problem. The other thing is to know how we're going to solve it. And we also started gathering more and more political commitments to address this. So we saw the first procedural resolutions at the United Nations, both in New York and in Geneva, on child marriage. We saw many more national commitments, Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Malawi, the Netherlands, the UK, the US, Yemen, just to mention a few. Um, we had child marriage recognized for the first time as a form of violence against girls and women at CSW. And in May, the high-level panel on the future of the, the development goals recommended that um, child marriage should be part of what is now called the, the SDGs. And that recommendation was then taken over by, by Ban Ki-moon. That might seem like kind of far away, but that is actually really important, has been very important. Um, we also had the first day of the African child. I think it was the first day of the African child, which had a huge number of our African members working together to basically raise more awareness about child marriage. And very importantly for us, we had grown so strong in terms of membership, but also in terms of financial supporters from, from donors, that we decided that Girls Not Brides would not longer be a project of the elders, but actually become an independent organization registered in the UK. And so, although we still have the moral support from the elders, as you know, Archbishop Tutu recently made a trip to Zambia, um, you know, they continue to speak out. We're now on our own, we've grown up, um, <laughs> which is good. <clears throat> and again, we saw that the momentum also kept growing in terms of our membership. At the end of 2013, we had more than 300 members, 325 from 55 countries. Now, all this new attention led to a very interesting development in 2014 with the Girls Summit, which was hosted by the UK government and UNICEF. And that was really the moment where I think many of us felt child marriage is no longer a taboo issue. Child marriage has now become the subject of a ministerial meeting and we see governments, many, many governments, making commitments. Around the Girls' Summit, we brought 50 of you together to basically work on common advocacy in a messaging framework and to make sure that at the summit we could amplify each other's work. And I think we did so very successfully because Girls Not Brides got a lot of attention and its members. So if you were there, let's do a little bit more of standing up. <laughs> Who was there in London? <laughs> Great. In 2013, we did another thing that I think was really important. We launched our theory of change, which we worked on for more than a year, and I know that more than 150 of us, as well as experts in other agencies, in, in governmental or intergovernmental agencies, were involved in this. And what I think the most important thing of the theory of changes is that we are now starting to really understand what needs to happen to address child marriage. And interestingly, this theory of change is not only influencing our own work. I know that many, many of the members use it to think about what you are doing, why you're doing it, how that's going to help to create change. But it is now also being used by governments and by some of the UN agencies to influence their funding decisions, to influence the way they're thinking about their national strategies, and to basically think about their overall programmatic work. So I think this is an absolutely major achievement. And if you are among the 150 people who were involved in creating this, stand up, please. 
Bravo, this is super. Real quick overview of what we did in 2014 in terms of what we saw happening um, uh, worldwide and also some of our own advocacy successes. We saw UNICEF and UNFPA launching a 12 country action plan, which I know many of you are involved in, in, look, in discussing what that might look like in your own country. Um, we advocated together and we achieved that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights issued a report on child marriage and there was a panel discussion at the High, uh, what is it, at the Human Rights Council for the first time, which meant that child marriage was not only longer seen as a development issue, but now also really became a human rights issue, which is important as we do advocacy work. In May 2014, the African Union launched the first ever campaign on child marriage in Africa, which is incredibly important, as you know. We also saw the first substantive UN resolution at the General Assembly, and there was the first official panel debate at the General Assembly about child marriage. Um, countries started to develop national campaigns or national action plans or national strategies. I must admit, I'm a little confused. I am not always sure what the difference is between a national campaign or a national action plan or a national strategy. But I know that one of the things we're going to try to do here in the coming days is understand what is happening in different countries and what we think collectively that governments should really be doing to end child marriage. So we will be talking about that. And then also throughout 2014, we all did a lot of work together to push for the idea that there should be a target in the post-2015 development framework in these SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, when they get adopted later this year. And so we managed to get draft language into, into the, the proposal that it now says that um, you know, one of the things the world should do is end harmful practices such as child marriage and FGM. And this is incredibly important because this is the agenda that's going to define where the world in the coming 15 years will be focusing in terms of development and obviously also where, where the money will be going. Um, so that was really good and, and hopefully in September we will see that this gets adopted. Now, all this is beautiful and lovely, but we also still have a little challenge. Because although we have seen new donors come in, governments and, and also private foundations with new resources, although we have seen many more political commitments, the reality is that the skill of the problem is still far, far bigger than the financial commitments and the political willingness to tackle child marriage. And this is what we're going to change. And the next time when we meet collectively, I want that balance to be a little better. And I hope that the next time after that, we're making it tipping, reaching the tipping point. Because that's when we create the world that we all would like to see. Now, where are we today? And let me come to this side so I can see how you lift. You know? We are, and this is really amazing, am I allowed? There we are, 475 members from 72 countries. And we are powerful. Collectively, we're really strong, and we have been making a major, major impact. Now look at the diversity. We are all over the world. All the dark gray countries are the places where we have members, and we'll keep growing. And the beauty of our membership is, that yes, we have big, big international NGOs who are members, but we also have ton loads of grassroots organizations who are working in the communities where the change needs to happen. Um, in fact, look at this. This is our, we, how we are spread in terms of numbers of members over the world. I'm sorry. And I was quite interested when I saw this to realize that less than 10% of our members are international NGOs. I mean, I don't think there are many partnerships, civil society partnerships, that are truly so much vested in the global south, in the countries where the change needs to happen. We then also started to create national partnerships. 
So when a number of Girls Not Brides members want to come to work together in a country, they can formally become a Girls Not Brides national partnership. And we have national partnerships right now in the countries where you see the green pins, Bangladesh and Nepal, Ghana, Mozambique, the UK and the US. But there are also different kinds of partnerships in the countries with the orange pins. Some of them are, are places where NGOs are coming together, Girls Not Brides members, but they have not yet requested to become formally a national partnership of Girls Not Brides. In other cases, people are working together, but for a variety of reasons, have decided that they do not want to be called Girls Not Brides on a national level. For example, because they also have non-civil society members included, which then makes it impossible, because we are a civil society organization in the end. Um, so, today we are here with 295 participants, 61 countries, and this does not include the staff of Girls Not Brides, nor the trainers. So we are an amazing group. Everybody who's here, can you please stand up? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Wonderful, welcome, welcome. Look, we've come a really long way since Atlas. Together, we have managed to achieve many successes and we've learned a lot. We have taken the taboo away of child marriage and we're now talking about solutions. The fundamental values of our partnership over these four years have not changed. We still know that change has to happen locally. We have to learn from each other change won't come quickly, and we have to work together. And I'm already excited and trying to imagine where the next time, I mean, we can't unfortunately meet every year in such a big group, um, but I'm already curious thinking, where will we be the next time? And, and you know, how much bigger will we be and how much more will we have achieved? I, by the way, do want to say one thing. I forgot to mention that earlier. There are a few people who cannot be here who would want to be here, and I just want to acknowledge them, especially our colleagues from Nepal. Luckily, some of our colleagues from Nepal are here, but unfortunately also quite a few of them had to stay home to deal with the terrible disaster that happened there. And I also want to acknowledge those people who had hoped to be here, but couldn't be here because of visa issues. We've tried everything we could to make sure that that, that would all be sorted, but sometimes, you know, other forces are stronger than us, not often. Um, <laughs> anyway, before I want to give the floor to Lakshmi, the executive director of Girls Not Brides uh, since September 2012, our fearless leader who guides us all so amazingly well, I just want to remind you all of what I strongly, strongly believe in. A world without child marriage will be a world in which all of us will be healthier, more educated, better educated, more prosperous, and more equal. So I look forward to working with all of you to continue to work together to make sure that girls can be girls and not brides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mabel. As Mabel said, my name is Lakshmi Sundaram. I'm the executive director of Girls Not Brides, and I want to add my own welcome to Mabel's. You've traveled so far, you've gone through so many hoops to, to make it here. We know about the individual stories, and we're so grateful that you've taken the time, that you've taken the energy, to, to actually come, and we really hope that this will be an opportunity where, again, you're among friends, you're among family, that you will be able to share, to recharge, and to go back home re-energized for the work that you're doing. I wanted to take a few moments um, to talk about where Girls Not Brides is going. Where, what are we looking towards? As Mabel said, we started off the, the partnership based on three founding objectives. So increasing awareness of the harmful impact of child marriage at all levels, expanded policy, financial, and other support, 
and making sure that there we're strengthening learning and coordination. Now these objectives are obviously incredibly broad, but what they do is they provide a framework for all of the members of the partnership to see their work fit in. But what we found over the course of the last few years um, is that members really wanted to also to supplement these big global objectives to really also identify a few key focus areas where we can really put all our energy together and really try and, and make an impact. So we spent some time to develop a, a more detailed strategy and really think through what some of those objectives might be. What might be the few areas, the handful of areas that we, as Girls Not Brides, as a group of civil society organizations from all over the world, where can we make the biggest difference? So what we did is we built on all the, the different meetings that, that Mabel had mentioned. Um, we collected from big discussions, from small discussions, from individual consultations, group consultations, and we also did a series of webinars with our members in English and in French to really try and understand what could these areas be? What are opportunities where, on the one hand, we all have a role to play to actually achieve the objective, but on the other hand, we're actually achieving that objective is going to make every single one of our work better, easier, more productive, more effective. So that's, that's how we came up with this three-year three strategy, which we're sort of halfway through right now. It runs until the end of, of 2016. And here are the five strategic objectives. And we'll go into more detail on these when we talk in the, the group regional strategy discussions, and they'll come up obviously at various other points of this meeting as well. But I just wanted to touch on them from a very high level perspective right now to, to give a sense of why it is that these are the five objectives that came up. So the first one is to encourage intergovernmental processes and fora to commit to action on child marriage. And as Mabel touched on this a, a bit in, in her presentation, one thing that we know is we as civil society can't make this change by ourselves. We need our government to really make and honor strong commitments to end child marriage. And intergovernmental fora, intergovernmental processes are a vehicle to encourage our governments to actually make these types of commitments. That's why this is important. We know we need to increase the evidence base on child marriage. We know a huge amount, and the experience in this room gives us an incredible primer on how to address child marriage. But we also need to acknowledge that there's a huge amount more we need to know, we need to learn, we need to understand to have the maximum impact. We need to make sure that countrywide efforts to end child marriage are supported and highlighted. And this is really important as well because one of the things, I'm sure you face this question a lot, I know I do, where people come up and say, yeah, that's fine, you can do a little pilot project here or there, but really, how are you going to reach these 15 million girls? Well, we need to demonstrate that we can actually reach these 15 million girls, and the way to do that is to show that change can happen on a large scale. And so we need to encourage that, highlight it, support it, make sure it happens, and make sure that when it happens in one place, other places, other countries think, hmm, it happened there, we can do it too. So that's why that's really important. Of course, this one on funding, I don't have to explain to you why this is important. We are not going to be able to see the changes we need if there's not the appropriate funding available for our work. And also, if that funding is not accessible to the sorts of organizations who are doing the day-to-day -day work with communities, with families, with girls themselves. So it's working with funders to increase 
the amount of money that's available, but it's also trying to find ways to actually make sure that civil society groups, particularly small civil society groups, have opportunities to access funding. And finally, and in many ways, most importantly, make sure that the global movement continues to grow and strengthen. We all know change is local, change happens in the lives of each individual girl, each of the 15 million girls married every year. But that change, we believe, can be accelerated by a global movement. That's one of the big reasons Girls No Brides was set up, and that's one of the reasons why we need to keep encouraging, growing this global movement. So it's a huge agenda, and we all have a really important role to play in it. Members, national partnerships, the secretariat, trustees, our friends, our partners. We need to bring everyone into actually making this happen. But I wanted to take a moment to touch specifically on what the secretariat can do and how the secretariat works. Many of you in the room have worked with us on almost a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis since Girls Not Bride started, but many of in, you in the room are newer to the partnership and may, we may not have had that kind of, of interaction. I encourage you during the course of this meeting to take the opportunity to, to talk to some of my colleagues and I'll introduce them in a, in a minute as well. So the Secretariat is obviously one part of, of um, the, the story, but what we, what we can help to, to do is we, we create tools, that tools that members can use to help advance their work. We try and identify opportunities where members may feel they want some additional capacity. And you'll see in the program, Heather will talk about this in more detail, that we've tried to identify a number of trainings on issues that you told us were important to you. We try and find ways to engage with the different types of, of actors um, and advocate on behalf of civil society. So trying to find ways to get stories about our members and the issue into the media. Trying to make sure that donors really think about the issue and, and incorporate child marriage into to their work. Pushing the UN, pushing academia, pushing governments to really not only work on child marriage, but also think of civil society as a close and trusted partner in that work. Now, we, support, we also support collective action by members and collective advocacy opportunities by members and find different ways to amplify both local efforts and global efforts that are ongoing to end child marriage. The Secretariat is not a funding body by any means, but what we try and do is identify and share as widely as we can to our members funding opportunities that we hear of and also create some of the spaces where members can learn more and take advantage of these opportunities, perhaps through webinars or perhaps through other types of, of ways of, of um, interacting, creating interactions between donors and uh, organizations themselves. And I'm gonna take a moment here to just pause and ask everyone from the Secretariat to stand up so that I can introduce you. So we have, I'll go clockwise. We have Luna, Heather, and then in the back we have Marta, Omera, Sophie, uh, uh, no, Leila, sorry. <laughs> Titi, Sol, Louis, Françoise, Ellen. Okay, come on up. <laughs> They can't see you. Come up. <laughs> so here we go. I'll reintroduce them really quickly. Laura, Ellen, Francoise, Louis, Sol, Luna, Heather, Marta, Omera, Leila, Titi, 
and we have a couple of colleagues outside. And also to note, we have two colleagues who are not here in Casablanca with us, Beata and Kate. And Kate is not here because she's actually getting married. She's becoming a bride. <laughs> she is not a girl, <laughs> just so to be very clear. Thank you. So please make sure you talk to them during the course of, of the meeting. Now, of course, the Secretariat is one small part of the story of how we're going to actually achieve these objectives. We won't achieve them if we don't have strong, engaged members. So what is it that you can do? Now, we're going to go into much more depth of this throughout the, the, the meeting itself, but here are a few things just to, to whet your appetite on the ways in which you can engage with the partnership and really try and, and advance some of the work that we do. Report on opportunities, share information, engage with the, the different types of webinars and other capacity building opportunities that we, we develop, and, and really also crucially provide feedback on those to let us know if they're fulfilling your needs or if we need to adapt them in different ways collaborate with other members, whether it's through the form of a national partnership or whether it's through the form of a working group or, or in much more of an informal way. Find ways to, to do that and, and, of course, help to grow the movement. The beauty is Girls Not Brides is a young organization. We want to be nimble. We want to be fit for purpose. We want to be responsive. We want to make sure we put in place the sorts of structures that will actually advance the issue and help us get more quickly to achieving the sorts of objectives, very ambitious objectives we've set ourselves. So if there are ways that you think we need to adapt how we're working, let us know. It's, if there's enough of you who feel that there's something that needs to happen, we'll try and find a way to make it happen. That's what we're, we're hoping to do. And then one of the ways we're trying to be responsive is really trying to understand from you what it is that you want to hear, want to learn about. Heather's going to talk a bit more about what that means through the terms of this meeting, but one of the things many of you told us is you wanted a bit of a snapshot of what actually is going on on child marriage. What are some of the, the, the latest numbers, etc.? Now much of this um, you'll also be able to, to find in, in your packs and in, in other materials that are floating around, but I just wanted to touch on a few things that I always find interesting when thinking about the big picture on child marriage. One is just the latest numbers that we have. There are 720 million women alive today who were married before the age of 18. Those are the, the latest numbers we have from UNICEF. Um, that's 15 million girls every year. One in three girls in developing countries is married under the age of 18. One in nine girls is married under the age of 15. You know, in all our messaging, we talk about how child marriage is a global issue. Look at this map. These are the countries with the highest absolute numbers of child brides who are married before the age of 15. Are you surprised by the countries that you see on that list? These are the top 10. It truly is a global problem. Now, what is the impact of child marriage? Many of you, of course, know this very well within the context of the work that you do. There's poverty. Child marriage traps girls, their families, their communities in a vicious cycle. There's health implications. Girls are significantly more likely to die in childbirth if they give birth before their bodies are ready. And actually, pregnancy and childbirth is the second leading cause of death for girls aged 15 to, to 19. Their babies are at risk as well of death, but also of poor health if they do survive. Of course, there's an education impact because girls are often pulled out of school to be married or are often pulled out as soon as they're married. We know that, that child marriage um, leads to incredibly varied forms of violence, physical, sexual violence, and also significant emotional abuse. And more fundamentally, it's a human rights violation of a whole host of rights that a girl is innately born with. Why is it that families marry off their girls? 
you know in your day-to-day -day work. Most parents love their children and want what's best for their children, but often poverty can push them to view child marriage as, as the only way out. They may be worried about the security of their daughters, um, whether it's because they're, they're in a context of conflict or a natural disaster, um, or whether it's because they're, they're in a situation where they just think that marriage provides a safe space without realizing actually the violence that happens within marriage. There's tradition. The parents, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, this is how it always happened. Why should there be anything different? And then it's also just this idea that a girl is less valuable than a boy. But we also know that while child marriage can look very different in different contexts, there are many similarities um, with the ways in which we can approach child marriage. Now, you will have an opportunity over lunch to discuss the particularities of the context that you face in your work and the particular questions, difficult questions that you're posed um, during those discussions. But we, we know that to take, um, to end child marriage, we need to look at, at the issue in an in a integrated, comprehensive way with long-term sustainable approaches, working together, making sure we have adequate resources, thinking about the long-term. And we also know that the sorts of, of um, strategies that we can focus on really boil down to four buckets. Empowering girls, mobilizing families and communities, providing services, and that services writ large, it includes schools, health, support services, other uh, legal services, etc., and establishing and implementing supportive laws and policies. Now, of course, how that actually plays out and what angles are more important are going to depend very much on the context. And I want to take advantage of the fact that we're here in Morocco, this beautiful country of Morocco, where 16% of, of girls are married before the age of 18 where we've seen huge progress over the last decade, but where there's still an incredible amount of work to do. And I wanted to, to focus on Morocco to give you a bit of a flavor of what, what the approaches to child marriage and the realities of child marriage can look like in a specific context. So we're incredibly lucky to have um, some experts on child marriage uh, on Morocco here with us. So I'm going to take this opportunity to please invite the three of you to, to come sit up on stage. So we're lucky to have with us representatives from the Fondation Ito, the Coalition Printemps de la Dignité, and the Hillary Rodham Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment at Al Aquine University. So I'm going to start off um, I'm going to say a few words in French, and some of the presentations will be in French. So please um, take your headsets if you need them. D'abord, je voulais vous souhaiter la bienvenue. Merci d'être venu ici pour nous parler un petit peu de la situation au Maroc. Maître Mehdi Sad de la Fondation Ito, est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler un petit peu de du travail de la Fondation et du travail que vous êtes en train de, de faire. So, uh, this is Maître Mehdi from the Fondation Ito, who's going to tell us a little bit about the work that they're doing. Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je suis ravi de participer à ce, cette réunion mondiale de votre organisation Girls Not Breeze. Euh, je suis ravi également que La lutte de notre organisation, la Fondation Ito, ce n'est pas une lutte isolée qui se trouve d'un seul pays du monde, mais c'est une lutte globale, une lutte humaine qui se trouve euh, et qui s'exerce dans, euh, dans tous les pays, dans tous les continents. Euh, le mariage des mineurs est un phénomène qu'on trouve, euh, qu trouve euh, partout. Euh, selon la loi marocaine, euh, le code de la famille parle de mariage de mineurs. Euh, le mineur, selon la loi marocaine, c'est chaque personne qui, est, qui a moins de 18 ans. Mais le phénomène social, il ne s'agit pas 
de, des deux sexes, mais il s'agit exactement euh, de mariage des filles mineures, puisque selon les statistiques du ministère de la Justice marocaine, euh, le mariage des mineurs euh, touche euh, dans 99% les filles, alors que 1% des jeunes garçons. Alors on, on doit être exact et parler de mariage de filles mineures et non seulement de mineurs. Euh, également, euh, la loi marocaine euh, permet dans son code de la famille, selon l'article 20 et l'article 21, euh, la demande d'autorisation de mariage de mineurs. Selon l'article le, 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 19, le mariage doit être fait à l'âge de 18 ans. Mais il y a des exceptions juridiques et sociales qui permettent au juge de la famille de donner la possibilité de ce mariage. Euh, selon les statistiques du ministère de la Justice, ces autorisations représentent, en l'année de 2007, elles représentaient 8% des mariages. En 2007, 8% des mariages au Maroc étaient des mariages de jeunes filles moins de 18 ans. Alors qu'en 2013, le chiffre a monté est devenu 13%. C'est plus que le, 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 le taux global. Le taux global, on vient de voir qu'il s'agit de 10%. Au Maroc, en année 2013, il s'agit de 13%. Euh, malheureusement, les statistiques euh, du ministère de la Justice marocaine ne sont pas suffisantes pour une seule, une seule et une simple raison. Les statistiques du ministère de la Justice concernent les mariages inscrits et enregistrés devant les tribunaux. Alors qu'une grande partie de mariages au Maroc, surtout dans le monde rural, surtout dans notre Maroc isolé, très différent de Casablanca, que vous êtes la bienvenue, euh, euh, dans d'autres pays, dans d'autres régions, le sud-est, la région de Midet, la région de Azila, la région de, de, de Azro, la région de l'Oriental, euh, il y a des régions où une grande partie des mariages ne sont pas enregistrés, surtout de le, dans le monde rural. Euh, euh, notre fondation, la Fondation Ito, euh, dans sa lutte contre ce genre de mariage, le mariage de filles mineures, euh, fait des caravanes sociales. En 2014, on a fait une caravane dans la région de Middels, et les résultats étaient malheureusement catastrophiques. Une grande partie de la population ne connaît même pas qu'il y, qu y ait un code de la famille qui organise les droits de, de la femme et de l'enfant. Une grande partie de mariages sont, se font avec la fatiha. La fatiha, c'est un surat du Coran. C'est un genre de mariage religieux et coutumier, mais n'est pas enregistré devant le tribunal. Le non-enregistrement de mariage prive la femme et prive l'enfant euh, dans le futur de ses droits en cas de divorce, en cas de mort de père, euh, en cas de, de, de l'héritage. Euh, L'enregistrement de mariage, c'est un droit pour la femme et pour euh, les enfants. Malheureusement, dans, dans plusieurs cas, le non-enregistrement, si on n'enregistre pas nos, nos droits, on ne peut pas les demander euh, euh, plus tard. Euh, la, euh, la Fondation a également fait en l'année 2010 une caravane sociale, non seulement dans le Maroc isolé du sud et du sud-est, mais en pleine Europe. Elle a touché les Marocains résidant en Espagne et en France. Euh, et les résultats n'étaient malheureusement pas très, n'étaient pas très différents des résultats qu'on a trouvés au sud et au sud-est du Maroc. Dans des communautés marocaines en France et en Espagne, on trouve Toujours des mariages de la fête avec la fatiha, des mariages non enregistrés, la polygamie, des mariages de filles mineures. Et je vous remercie et je suis prêt pour vos questions. Merci, Merci beaucoup, Maître Nsan. Je vais maintenant passer à Asma El Mehdi, Asma qui vient de la coalition Printemps de la Dignité, une autre euh, coalition euh, au Maroc. Asma, la parole est à vous. Bon, euh, merci. Euh, la coalition Printemps de la Dignité, c'est un collectif de 25 associations euh, qui euh, œuvrent pour euh, qu'il y ait une révision du système de la justice euh, au Maroc. 
euh, de manière à ce que euh, le système judiciaire marocain protège les femmes et les filles des violences et qu'il prohibe les discriminations. Euh, par rapport euh, au printemps de la dignité, c'est un collectif aussi qui se positionne en tant à la fois que force de proposition et de pression et, et qui a fait le choix de travailler, comme je l'ai dit, sur le législatif parce que nous considérons que le système de la justice a besoin d'une espèce de mise à niveau en matière d'égalité de sexe, de protection des femmes et des filles des crimes de genre et de garantie de leur accès à la justice et de leur droit à l'équité. Euh, dans ce sens, nous estimons que les chantiers de réforme qui sont actuellement ouverts au Maroc peuvent constituer une opportunité pour influencer les décideurs en vue d'une prise en considération des intérêts des femmes et des filles. Dans ce sens, nous avons procédé à l'élaboration de différentes recherches-actions qui avaient pour but de faire des analyses critiques des lois qui sont en vigueur et qui sont en cours de réforme, autour à la fois du code pénal, du système judiciaire, de, du projet de loi sur la violence, euh, de certains articles relatifs au mariage des mineurs. Nous avons aussi élaboré différents mémorandums autour du code pénal, autour d'un projet de loi sur la violence de genre, autour de la question du mariage des mineurs, autour de l'avortement, etc. Euh, comment nous procédons euh, D'abord, euh, première question euh, cruciale pour nous, c'est que euh, nous avons un ancrage réel dans la société et qui donne une légitimité euh, incontestable à notre action. Notre ami de l'Institut ITO a parlé de son action. ITO, ça fait partie, c'est une association membre de la coalition du printemps de la dignité et ça donne une étendue un petit peu de tout ce qui se fait en termes d'action terrain euh, auprès de la population cible auprès de, de, de la population directement concernée. Ceci nous donne la possibilité d'assurer que quand nous faisons des revendications, nous, les, nous revendiquons à la base de ce qui se passe sur la réalité et nous euh, construisons notre argumentaire en partie sur l'impact négatif des lois sur les femmes et les filles et sur le fait que ce n'est pas équitable, ce n'est pas juste que toute cette population euh, vivent dans des conditions, euh, euh, des conditions qui euh, sont insoutenables parce que les lois marocaines ne les protègent pas. Euh, deuxième euh, donnée par rapport à, euh, à notre euh, action, c'est que nous travaillons au niveau euh, organisationnel via à la fois un euh, leadership euh, tournant par rapport à la coalition et euh, qui se base sur le consensuel, bien sûr, et nous nous basons sur l'appui de différents réseaux au niveau des régions, ce qui donne une possibilité d'action un petit peu partout euh, au Maroc. Euh, par rapport à notre travail, euh, nous avons... Euh, à notre travail relatif au mariage de mineurs, comme l'a dit euh, notre ami, euh, le code pénal, euh, pardon, le code de la famille au Maroc fixe l'âge du mariage à 18 ans via son article 19. Sauf que quand il fixe cette loi, nous avons différentes possibilités de transgresser la loi, soit via des articles qui constituent des exceptions, type article 20 et 21 euh, du Code de la famille qui donne sous des conditions spécifiques le droit d'un mariage euh, en dessous de l'âge de 18 ans, euh, soit via d'autres formes de transgression, c'est ce qu'on appelle l'enregistrement du, du mariage, c'est le, de, de, le, le fait qu'on puisse enregistrer le mariage hors délai du mariage et on considère que le mariage euh, existe de fait avant même son enregistrement. Et ceci euh, aussi, c'est le fameux article 16 et qui donne une possibilité de transgresser la loi et de, euh, de, de donner la possibilité de mariage pour des mineurs. Ce sont ces volets-là qui, qui vont constituer l'angle d'attaque de, de, de notre coalition pour travailler autour euh, de la question du mariage de, de, des mineurs. Euh, euh, en fait, euh, 
nous avons saisi dans ce sens l'opportunité euh, du fait que euh, le, 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 le gouvernement, mais aussi euh, le Parlement, euh, ont essayé à la fois euh, d'assurer de, de, une extension dans la durée de cet article 16 qui, euh, qui par décret euh, du ministère, euh, peut être prolongé parce qu'au départ, il ne de, devait durer que cinq ans. Et nous avons aussi saisi l'opportunité d'une proposition euh, de loi, je ne sais plus si c'était une proposition, un projet de loi du ministère euh, qui, voulait, euh, en, qui voulait formellement mettre en œuvre l'une des revendications de, euh, onusiennes par rapport à la limitation de l'âge minimal du mariage euh, en disant que l'âge minimal du mariage, ça va être 16 ans. Or, c'est quelque chose, c'est une, une aberration, parce que, euh, via cet article, on veut donner l'impression de progresser, alors qu'au Maroc, la majorité des mariages de mineurs se situe entre 15 et 5 ans. Donc, de fait, ça, ça allait être une forme de légitimation de l'âge de mariage des mineurs et du coup une régression même par rapport à la loi existante. Euh, donc c'était un petit peu là le contexte, c'était était là la situation problème qui a fait que nous avons commencé à travailler particulièrement sur le mariage des mineurs en tant que coalition. Euh, dans cette, ce sens-là, on s'est basé à la fois sur des statistiques, les statistiques du ministère de la Justice lui-même qui nous donne euh, en 2014 un chiffre comme 11,47% 47 de mariages contractés euh, pour des mineurs. Nous avons une donnée du Haut Commissariat au plan qui nous donne un chiffre comme 9% des adolescents âgés entre 15 et 19, euh, et 19 ans qui sont mariés, et nous avons une étude qui a été effectuée par ITO euh, dans deux régions du Maroc qui, qui nous donne un chiffre comme 45% de mariages qui concernent des mineurs, particulièrement ce sont des filles, c'est un phénomène qui est très féminisé. Euh, et en se basant sur ça, on a montré que nous étions dans une logique de contournement de la loi euh, parce que le mariage des mineurs c'est une transgression en fait, de fait, de euh, la loi marocaine. Euh, dans cette logique-là, nous, nous nous sommes basés sur un argumentaire qui se voulait global, euh, dans ce sens que euh, on a essayé à la fois d'axer sur la réalité euh, et le vécu des filles mineures mariées. Nous avons accès aussi sur le médical euh, pour montrer à la fois l'impact du mariage des mineurs, mais aussi le fait qu'il y a une incapacité de prise de décision pour la fille mineure, vu que même physiologiquement, euh, le, le, le lobe frontal n'est pas assez développé pour qu'elle puisse être, prendre des décisions euh, qui sont euh, réfléchies. Nous sommes euh, basés sur euh, la question du développement et combien ça tire vers le bas euh, le développement euh, du Maroc. Voilà. Je crois que dit Merci. Merci énormément pour cette intervention. And now I'm going to pass to Dr. Nadia Sonneveld, who is a scholar in residence at the Hillary Rodham Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment at Alakwain University. Thank you. Thank you. Is it on? Yes, it is. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I will start with a case I came across a few weeks ago. It concerns a 17-year-old Moroccan female who had a sexual relationship outside of marriage with a Moroccan male who was in his 20s. They wanted to get married, but the legal guardian of the, of the female did not agree. And with sexual relationships outside of marriage still being a criminal offense under the Moroccan penal code, the man was sentenced to prison. At the Hillary Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment, we study the issue of uh, underage marriage in Morocco. And we, in general, we aim to be at the forefront of gender studies scholarship in Morocco and in North Africa. Um, we always try to employ a holistic approach 
And to use Karol Popper's famous black swan problem, we do not only look for white swans, we also look for black ones. Yeah, in the case of merits of minors, this means that we approach the matter from different angles and we try to contextualize the phenomenon. For example, if the legal guardian of the girl had given his consent to the, to the relationship, would we then define it as a child marriage or would we define it as a young adult marital relationship? In my own present research, I focus on how judges in Morocco deal with requests made by minors to get married. As my colleagues have already told you, the legal age of marriage in Morocco is 18. But sometimes family law judges may authorize uh, uh, the marriage of minors under certain circumstances. And to give you an idea, in 2011, 47,000 requests were being made of which almost 90% were granted. Well, based on my ongoing research and on interviews with 43 judges, both males and females, I have come to the preliminary conclusion that judges do not allow these types of marriages in a certain number of cases. First of all, when the girl is under the age of 16, they will usually not allow it. When the difference in age is too big, they will not allow it. When the difference in education is too big, they will not allow it, and uh, when the girl is still studying. They will, however, often approve of these requests in um, cases where the, where the girls or the women are um, from remote mountainous areas. For example, our uh, the Hillary Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment is based at Al Alagoan University in Ifren. Ifren is located in the Middle Atlas Mountains, one hour from Fes and Meknes. Um, girls from these mountainous areas who do not have an education or little education and whose marriages um, have been approved of by their parents and the community in general. In these cases, just judges will often give their permission because they will marry in any case, informally, in front of the community, regardless of the consent of the judge. So the judges are saying we do not have a choice or we have a little choice, but to give at least legal recognition to these types of marriages for the sake of the, in the interest of the minor and the baby she might have in the future in order to make sure that the children will at least have access to education and to health care. Um, I also asked the judges to respond to the case I presented you at the beginning. And here a different picture emerges with some judges saying that, you know, since sex outside of marriage is still forbidden, both legally and socially, and given the fact that everything that's forbidden is desired and attractive, it makes more sense to allow the 17-year-old to marry her 20-year-old lover. Uh, other judges have a completely different opinion and would say that, you know, especially if she is still studying, the marriage will have a negative impact on her studies and for that reason, she, you know, they would vote against it. Um, also, as long as the future spouses do not have a, a, a proper source of income, they are not in a position to establish a serious marital relationship, not even when their parents are willing to contribute financially to the marital relationship. There is one thing all judges agree on, and that is that the marriage of minors is a complicated matter with many different faces and with a strong need for contextualization. There is no one way to define the best interest of the minor and the children she might have in the future. Each case, they are saying, stands on its own unique facts. Thanks for your attention and I am open to any questions you might have. Thank, thank you so much to all three of our speakers for giving us a really interesting, rich snapshot of the situation here in Morocco.